Elizabeth and I would start by saying thank you both to Elizabeth and to John Cherry for organising this conference and inviting us to speak. As you said, this is a joint talk to myself and Rob Webley. I'll be doing the talking at this point, but he is here if there are questions later. Um, and we hope really our talk will be an introduction to the work of the Portable Antiquity Scheme. And that hopefully will provide kind of a general background for some of the talks um, from Helen Geek later um, today, but also to the talk by um, Malcolm Jones next week, for example. So I'll just get our talk up. So I should say also, Rob Webb and I no longer work for the Antiquity Scheme, both of us did for many years, probably over 20 years between us, but um, we're both currently other projects, but we're still quite involved in doing things like training with the scheme and involved in working on that material. So the Board of Antiquity Scheme, as um, Elizabeth mentioned, is a national scheme across England and Wales to record objects found by members of the public. It's voluntary for people to record things, apart from the case of treasure cases, and the Port of Antiquity School records things from everyone, but obviously a lot of the metal finds come specifically through metal detecting. And I would say right at the beginning that the kind of information we are able to pull out, the pictures we can share with you, the data, is all built on the work of all those hardworking flows up and down the country and volunteers who work with them, and also of those who offer for their finds for recording. And I think, you know, that, that thanks has to be there right at the beginning to kind of provide that data, which we can then use. So, as you said, finds recorded through the Port of Antiquity Scheme are stratified finds which lack a kind of vertical context within a site, but retain a horizontal context within the landscape. The pre-circulated summary we sent out gave some details and numbers, um, so if you want to know more about the scheme, do have a look there. But to summarise, the PS has recorded over 7,700 seal matrices, as well as quite large quantities of cloth and product seals, bullet and seal rings, which will also be of interest to seglographers. Um, one feature of the Port of Antiquity Scheme to every find, as well as having a detailed record, for an example, here of one for uh, um, Papal Burr, is that they have a precise find spot accessible to registered users. So this kind of centralised national publicly available data is the PS's real main strength and allows both for a kind of detailed approach to individual matrices through the good photographs or to small groups of matrices or a kind of big data approach and that's the approach we're really taking today. Um, as the map on the left shows, which is the density of all medieval finds recorded through the Port of Antiquity Scheme, there is some variation across the country. But as you can see from the map on the right, where we've got map the medieval and post-medieval seal matrices, there are examples from across the country. There's no area without them. But um, this kind of variation, there is some variation in the density. And think about areas where work can happen. There is quite a lot of opportunity there for local and regional research and regional comparisons of um, both the adoption of kind of seals in general, seal practices, but also in particular features of the seals. Kind of, I know um, you've done some work with on the um, kind of adoption of the Marian cult, things like the existence of lilies and so on seals, and looking at that kind of regional variation would be something that could be done through the Port of Antiquity Scheme reasonably easily and conveniently from home, which is always useful during a pandemic. So, um, but like I said, a lot of opportunity there to look at variations between the matrices across the country and that regional variation. And one reason we really want to give this talk is to hopefully kind of inspire more people to use the data, to use this and to use it in their research and encourage their students to use it as well and enhance our knowledge in that way. So before going into kind of more statistical analysis, the Port of Antiquity Scheme seal metrics data in comparison to other resources, we want to talk about some specific objects recorded by the PS and how they give an insight into the life cycle of seals. So starting the beginning of that life cycle with the production, with the creation. And the evidence for this includes um, moulds such as the one here on the left from Lincolnshire, 
for a multi-section copper iron mold for a pedestal type seal matrix. But we can also look at the matrices themselves where there are clear design links between matrices. On the right, you can see um, two examples from Kent. They've got an unusual back design. Interestingly, looking at them in detail, they're not necessarily from the same um, mold, but they're obviously a very unusual design, which is presumably the mark of that particular producer of the seal matrix blank. Um, and the, so I'm just gonna, okay, so you may not be able to, you can just see one picture of me, hopefully carrying the mess of it. So, and that kind of looking at back designs, using that to link different makers together is something where there's really quite a lot of potential, I think, for further work. Um, I know Helen also talks a little bit, Hanke talks a little bit about back marks in her session. But like I said, this is an area that could be looked at. Um, we have tried to find links for many of the objects we're showing on our pre-circulated summary. So I think they were originally as direct links. I'm not sure those links are always working. But if there's something you see an object you see here that you want the link for and need help finding, then do get in touch with us. So you've got your basic kind of matrix. And the next stage of production is the kind of engraving of the matrix with the design and legend. And one of the strengths of the PS data is that we now have a really good range of partially engraved for uncompleted matrices. And obviously this is the sort of thing that we don't really see perhaps often in archive, seal impressions, or in museum collections. And knowing now that there's this kind of large number of unengraved and incomplete matrices, it's just perhaps there was often quite a reasonable gap between the casting of the matrix and engraving them, particularly the lead alloy personal matrices of the 13th century. And that the partially engraved seals are then discarded again suggests that these have been done not where the people are originally casting the matrices, where they've got access to furnaces for recycling material, but at a later stage and separately. It's been suggested um, by a few authors that based on seal impressions that come from seals made by the same hand, that simple, cheaper seals may be produced particularly for the signing of one document. I think of an example particularly from Hyde Abbey and Winchester here and given that kind of thought could we go further built on the data we've got here and suggest that legends and designs on some of these simpler easily cut lead alloy seals might even be the work of more generalized class rather than specialist seal makers. Perhaps lead alloy blanks were kept to hand and cut as needed. There's obviously is kind of a speculation, but builds on the suggestion perhaps of John McEwen, the study of seal makers in London, that there might be separate production routes for lead alloy matrices and copper alloy ones. Obviously, carving even quite a soft metal and writing an inscription backwards are not easy and do require some skill, but perhaps the skills more of a clerk or some attached to a um, scriptorium rather than those of a metal worker. And kind of another little strand of evidence perhaps in support of the suggestion, so I'm trying to bring it up so you can see as well, um, is the, the kind of other examples of seals made on reused other objects. So this is, this is the favorite seal I'm gonna show you of our entire session here, or my favorite one, is a reused um, papal bullet here. You can see on the left, you can see the, um, remains of the raised design of the bullet, which has then been cut down the backs or if I'm actually with the, the Pope's name has been smoothed and it's been cut to make a seal matrix, um, probably the name Thomas, although obviously it's now incomplete. Um, and there are other examples of reused bullet to a known. So these people who are not casting the matrices, but they're making seals, matrices. And there's also one example here of a reused harness pendant from Norfolk, which is certainly Rob's favourite seal of the ones that seal matrix, the ones we're showing you. And this paper bullet kind of leads us neatly on to the end life of seals, because you can see that one reason we only have part of it is it's been cut deliberately to destroy it. Um, is to, we're going straight from here, production, we're skipping over the use life, which obviously the imprint project and perhaps other research says more of, and we're going to go straight on to the end. 
Because again, this is what somewhere where the PS data set is bringing new evidence and new kind of areas that can be researched. And that's because they're quite a big range again of cut and deliberately defaced seals on the database. Again, perhaps more usually the personal seals and the lead alloy, perhaps because the research is destroyed by hand, perhaps because recycling lead alloy is less priority cost-wise. Um, the top left example here shows damage with a bend, which may be post deposition, but as well as a deliberate cut. Um, and I would say this is an area where, given this new data set, more work could be done. Looking at the method and the style of destruction, we can see clear kind of um, knife cut marks on the one bottom right. But also thinking kind of perhaps more abstractly about how much defacing is needed to make a seal unusable. Was simply removing the center, as has been done to that copper alloy example, enough? Or did part of the legend need to be removed? In a wider sense, that allows us to understand how people at the time, what people at the time thought was necessary for a seal. What do you need to destroy to make this object no longer a seal matrix? What, what is the critical bit? Do you need to destroy the image? Do you need to destroy the legend? Do you need to destroy both? How, how much of a seal would still operate as a seal, if that makes sense? So having got to the end and destroyed the seal matrix, got to the end of the life cycle, um, what I want to do now is to go on to look at the PS data set as a whole and compare it to kind of other data sets. And I'm afraid that does mean we get to the bit where we move away from perhaps some nice images of individual seals onto seal matrices, onto lots of charts and graphs. So let's get the slide going on. So first of all, dating. And as unstratified defines, dating of PS material is of course stylistic. And what we're comparing this slide is an heuristic plot of PS material with the um, now online collections of the British Museum and with the National Archive Collection 13 of seal impressions. And I have to we chose that collection just because it was readily accessible and the data was very easy to search. Um, I haven't put the two graphs together. The reason is, is because the PS1 is plotted in an heuristic manner, which we're graphing um, dates of varying precision together, but it means it's kind of not directly comparable, perhaps particularly to the National Archive data. So what we see in all of them, however, is this sudden peak in the 13th century. Yes, there are low numbers in the 12th century, in some cases in the 11th century, but there's a sudden huge peak in the 13th century. Um, and that's both very visible here in the PAS and the National Archives and some extent in the British Museum as well. Um, what happens with the archives, however, is that that peak drops off very quickly in the 14th century, whereas on the British Museum, it's actually higher in the 14th century and the PS retains a very strong peak. And this can in part be a factor of dating precision, obviously more close often with, um, with kind of um, archive material where it's attached to a particular document. But it may also relate to a change in seal use, which I'll discuss later. So the National Archive Data also had a peak, a uh, kind of secondary peak in the 16th century. That's the blue peak here, you can see. Um, and a cursory look suggests that relates to great seals, which are absent from the PS data and not as common in the British Museum collection. And I think one thing that again brings that theme or return for our talk is the type of seals that get preserved um, through history in order to make it into archives can relate to the kind of documents they're attached to, which may mean great seals are more preferentially surviving in archives than some other types. Um, one thing that's quite interesting to me, given I know Ella Talk is going to talk, Ella Paul, so I was going to address this next week, is this um, 15th to 16th century weakness and whether that's a factor of genuine changes in behaviour or whether it's a factor of our own dating blindness. So I'm really interested to hear what she has to say. Now, both the PAS and the British Museum data, so here in orange and the PAS up here, have another strong peak in the 18th century. And this isn't really represented at all in the archive collection we we're looking at. And 
one reason for this is this is a change in use partly to seals as um, kind of dormant and decorative use. Obviously, they were worn in the medieval period as well. But when we think particularly of the fog seals of the 18th century, this becomes a very widespread method of adornment. And also the use of seals as seals of closure, so on personal letters, rather than authorization. And that change in use um, makes them perhaps harder, I'd suggest, to study through archives um, rather than through the matrices. And it's interesting to think we know that's what's happening perhaps in the 18th century, and that's why the difference is there. Is that also what's happening in the 14th century? And that's why the difference is there then as well. So again, think about gaps. Well, research, of course, exists on the 16th to 18th century seals. There are also perhaps an under-researched resource in terms of design choices, materials, affiliations. And so just to show another personal favorite, which I'm looking at for other research. Um, here's an 18th century example of a um, rotating fob seal. Um, it's an example praising um, Frederick, King of Prussia, and it's very kind of cheap, kind of small, you can see how tiny it is, personal object that's showing popular support for the Seven Years' War. And that kind of interpretation of some of these um, fob seals, like I said, is another area wide open for further research. So, Moving on from dating to material. And as the discussion on kind of bulk production has perhaps already started making kind of raising, one of the strengths of PX is at the cheaper end of the market. And this is seen in the materials. So compared to the British Museum collection, and here we're only looking at medieval material, um, which if we see is quite the British Museum is quite comparable in date, what we see is that um, for, for both, copper eye is the most common material. And then the majority of the rest is made up of silver and lead. The British Museum also has some stone and organic material matrices. The PS has none for this period, and both have a negligible number of gold matrices. The contrast, however, between the British Museum and the PS data is clear. Um, the, the lead alloy seals, the kind of cheaper end of the market in raw material, and most often in skill of design, represents 40% of the Port Atlantic Peace Scheme data and only 11% of the British Museum data. And I'd say there's probably a double bias behind this, that it's easy to say there's museum collection bias, and I'm sure, I'm afraid there is. But also I'd say there's probably a bias of loss. If anything, silver seals once found are more likely to be recorded with the PAS as their recordings are legally enforced through treasure rather than voluntary. So it's unlikely to be a bias of recording. The bias of loss can come from the inherent value of the material, the obviously silver, but also that wealthy people and institutions have more to fear from the loss and misuse of their seal, both due to the kind of value of their land holdings and credit, but also, as we've seen by contemporary cases, there is much more risk of fraud by people in their employ or by someone else finding and using their seal, and there are cases known of that. So, in the final part of the talk, um, I want to move on from the seal matrices, physical objects, from their material, from the kind of way they're being made, to think about the designs and the legends. And these figures and those are following are based on our categorization of a sample of Pierce medieval data. There's always, it'd be great to see more work and more interregional comparisons of this when it wants to take on that pattern. So, um, as was raised in the pre-circulated summary and as with Rose Smith in her introduction, there has been a shift in seal matrices away from a focus on institutional seals, which has been suggested to account for perhaps 20% of those in archives, to personal seals, the kind of other 80% of the stuff out there in archives. However, as these graphs make clear, that shift has perhaps not gone far or fast enough. Well, for the British Museum, and we assume other museums, institutional seals make up 40% of their collection. For PAS, this is only 3%. And here I'm lumping together, obviously, governmental seals, religious institutions, and various other institutions. But you can see how small a proportion that is of the um, PAS data. Again, there are biases against loss of this type of seal, you know, as we mentioned with the seal seals. But I argue part of this discrepancy is the survival bias amongst documents as well, towards those of larger institutions and the wealthy in general. 
It's also worth noting the very large proportion of anonymous seals in both the British Museum and the PS data. Um, we really, I'm afraid, struggle to find a readily comparable figure for archives. It may be some people today have those figures immediately to hand and can say whether this is true, but my impression is that the proportion of anonymous seals in archives is much lower. And here we're talking about seals which don't name the individual. Um, and that, again, may mark the anonymous seals' greater use as seals of closure. It's not to say that anonymous seals aren't found in archives, I know they are, but, and they are used as seals of authority, but it's about the relative popularity of different uses of different types of seals and designs. And again, if studies are focusing on seal impressions in archives, then it's no wonder that such seals perhaps are under-researched relative to their perhaps true popularity out there in the medieval period. So it seems useful because we've got that data to kind of categorise these anonymous seals, to think about the type of messages being given by these. And in future, to our comparison with their survival in the archives and what that tells us about their kind of different use of different types of documents. And this also perhaps will provide a useful background to later discussions of individual seals this type by um, Malcolm Jones next week. What we see is that over a third of these kind of anonymous legends um, focus on the role of the seal itself. And we're thinking here about um, seals, I'm going to have to apologise for my Latin, which is non-existent. We're thinking about seals such as um, frange lege tege, so um, break, read, conceal. A further third are religious, and these can vary from very grand 14th century copper alloy, pointed alloy seals with standing seals and kind of kneeling figures, right down to the very simple Hill of Calvary images, such as this one with um, the SOS Amor Me. The final third is, again, perhaps disproportionately where a lot of attention has been focused on the kind of amatory and hunting examples and the funny joking legends. And it's tempting because they're, they're really fun ones. <laughs> but it's important to bear in mind that these are only a small proportion of this. And again, it'd be great to compare some of these statistics to archives. And hopefully these figures provide a kind of useful baseline for that sort of future comparison. It would also be good to see more work in future on dating and how the use of these images changes through time um, amongst the PS data set as well as in archive and seal impressions. Um, this obviously is looking at the legend and it is the case that hunting scenes, for example, can be combined with legends talking about the role of the seal, for example. So to the designs, we finally turn. And Moving from the legend sign, this is when we can really start using the excellent resource of Digisync, and we sent a link, I think, in the pre-circulated summaries, and just have to say thank you to the creator of that, which by categorising seals, an online database allows us to compare the PS data to their data. Um, and because it's their one thing talking about data consistency, we can see where they've applied a particular term to a particular design. We can be sure that we're applying it to the same types of designs because we can see the visual visual record of their example. Um, although Digisig I know is pulling in PAS data at the moment because it's not categorised, um, it doesn't turn up when you're kind of looking through their proportions. So um, what their categorised data is mainly archive and museum based, so it's kind of comparison to the PAS data. So looking at this, what we see is kind of a real clear discrepancy in that the kind of designs being found in catalogued archive museum collections are very different. So within the PAS devices, and here we're talking about things like fleur-de-lis or radiating devices the most common, followed by animals. In contrast on digital uh, humans and objects predominate. And when we break this down um, in detail, just give some examples there of a, an animal, a device, a standing figure and of an object, nice hatchet there. So um, if we break this down in detail, a lot of this discrepancy is actually caused by kind of a few particular motifs within these classes. So it's a very complicated graph, but just to say the red and blue dots represent the portions of seals of that sign on Digisig in red or PAS in blue. And for most, actually they're not that, for most classes in each kind of column in effect represents a class, they're not that far apart partly actually because most of these designs aren't that common. So the difference between one and 3% just isn't that great. 
that makes sense. But um, what we see is there are some real discrepancies. It's much stronger. The digital data is much stronger in terms of full length human figures and representations of heraldic shields within the object class. Um, and that this kind of difference is not just a product source we can categorize so far in Digisig, it's shown by archival research. So there's only 2% of PS data is armorial designs, and this can be compared to the 17% of London and 15% in Durham Newcastle that I know this would be found in your research. So again, we're seeing a difference between the matrices that are lost and the seals that survive on documents to make it into archives. The high number of animals in pairs seems to reflect the high number of hunting related creatures, particularly anonymous seals. And again, are we looking at a difference there in terms of um, the kind of different uses of these different seals and the, what then happens that while those seals may be used on legal texts, are they more popular because they're more popular being used on personal letters and documentation? Um, finding the PS data has a lot more radial devices and notably more stylized lilies. And these are particularly common on lead alloy matrices. 44% of all lead alloy matrices are sampled compared to two like copper alloy. Um, well, radial signs, obviously, I know, sorry, sorry, I'm going to the search again here, should not be assumed to be a below status individual. I think it's fair to again, we're seeing a link between a less individual design and intrinsically less valuable material and the PS data set of seals, which people are more likely to lose. Um, I'm just coming to the end, sorry. So <laughs> these are people who are choosing a lead alloy seal or being provided with one. Uh, perhaps people, I just wonder whether people who do not need as hard wearing a seal or to invest in much money in a fancy material or individualized design. A group who perhaps don't need to use a seal as often, a seal in fewer land or other legal documents and expect their seal impression to be seen by fewer people. And therefore the display potential, which I know is something discussed a lot in SEALs and we'll discuss very much Davis next week, which might encourage people to invest in SEAL that's messaging medium, it's kind of less. I would suggest that the documentation of these people is also less likely to survive than that of a large institution. So overall, differences here are perhaps not surprising, but they seem to confirm that we are in the PS database revealing a largely different sector of the medieval SEAL using population. Seal matrices of different styles and of different individuals are having different types of use lives and different life cycles, which can lead to different design choices, but also difference in where and how they're used and ultimately whether they survive for us to study today, whether it's discarded objects we've been looking at here or impressions in archives. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I mean, that was absolutely fascinating, very exciting. Uh, we have a lot of questions. I don't know whether we're going to get through them all now. So I'm going to throw some of them at you. Maybe um, Helen could also uh, speak to, to some of these as well, mm -hmm. uh, her paper. Um, why 500 paper buller in the PAS from that? <laughs> so why are there? <laughs> Um, so there's a suggestion of whether some of them are ones where the document has been destroyed, things like the um, Reformation, but also the suggestion that some may have been deliberately used, kind of reused in new ways. I'm looking at Rob here, because <laughs> he has more comment. No, he's shaking his head as well. Um, I, I think there has been work on this and I would just point them to the work of um, Tim Pestle here, who's recently published about that, and we can find that reference if useful. Yeah. There's also, if I can break in, there's also um, something that's been done on paper bully in the Netherlands by, um, I've got a note of Bartels 2017. Um, mm -hmm. And really, I think we're a bit desperate, aren't we, Laura, for somebody to come in and do a bit more work on the paper bully. I mean, Tim that's tries, but we, need, we could do with a PhD student. Yes. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, I'm just taking these in order. Next one from Ella Paul. Um, there are also similar gaps in 15th century evidence in Scotland. Um, mm. But do you have other objects being reused as seal matrices? I'm only aware of Buller and the harness pendant. I think I'm trying to think of other objects that could be. I think the problem is, is to what extent when we think about other types of seal, particularly cloth seals and so on, the impression would really hide any other data 
I think, again, it's a case of a really good search to prepare to maybe bring more of these up. And again, it'd be a wonderful project for somebody. But yeah, Buller are the one I can think of at least two or three examples. And like I said, the Hans Pendant. Thank you. From Paul Drury, why are there so many discoveries recorded from East Anglia? From East Anglia? Um, a history of excellent liaison in that area, particularly in Norfolk. Um, it's also a geographical reason, obviously it's a very heavily ploughed agricultural landscape compared to the upland landscapes. But yeah, that combination of a lot of activity there in terms of the agriculture and also that long history of liaison and also slightly more investment in terms of the number of people recording, you know, the number of staff recording in that area. Right, 